American Airlines Flight 11 hits the North Tower of the World Trade Center. United Airlines Flight 175 hits the South Tower. American Airlines Flight 77 crashes into the Pentagon. The Trade Center's South Tower collapses. United Airlines Flight 93 crashes in a field near Shanksville. Part of the Pentagon's outer ring collapses. The Trade Center's North Tower collapses. In one hour and 42 minutes, thousands of lives were lost. Thousands more lives were changed. And America, as we knew it, was changed forever. I was on one of the upper floors of the U.S. Steel Tower. I was in Washington, D.C. Work in construction. My mom had called and left a message to turn the TV on. The FBI has confirmed at least four planes have been hijacked. All of a sudden you see the, the, the walls crumbling. Everything just came down. We were all in shock. Could not believe that we live in this country and something like this could happen. The pilot added power to the engines. I heard it spool up a little more. And then I lost it behind a building and then it came out and I saw it hit. What made it strange to me was that how eerily quiet it became because there was no air traffic going over. Just a hole in the ground and telephone book size pieces, no discernible airplane parts anywhere. It's difficult to describe the range of emotions everyone feels when they not only learn about these incidents today, but they've actually seen them. It was just a lot of sadness and just the chaos. I was just in shock, and I started having tears. Guys, says, no, this can't be for real. It was like the world was ending. It was, it was horrible. It was, I was scared for my children, scared for my husband. The world, it was just the worst day. On September 11th, 2001, the fabric of this nation was torn apart by terrorists who hijacked four airplanes and carried out a plan to attack America. Thousands of people were killed. The U.S. was left reeling. And soon after, this country went to war. A war that became the longest conflict in U.S. history one that just ended less than two weeks ago. And 20 years later, America is still healing. For some, the wounds from that day and all the years that followed may never heal. But as we mark two decades since 9-11, we remember the lives lost that day. We remember the emergency responders who came from all over the country to help. We remember the military members who fought the war on terror, and we remember the families left behind. Including the families of Flight 93 victims, who see the crash site in Somerset County as hallowed ground. And as John Shumway explains, they also see the memorial there as a way to keep their loved ones' memories alive. I go up several times a year, kind of feel drawn to it. The Flight 93 Memorial is where Ken Naki feels closest to his brother Joey. I don't look at it, he's been gone five years, 10 years, 15 to 20. I miss him as much as I do today as I did back in 2001. It's the little things Ken misses most. Probably around 7.45, at least once or twice a week, I'd be getting a phone call waking me up just saying, hey, what are you doing? I love you and I miss you. And haha, I woke you up and, and hang up on me. Those are the things I miss. He didn't realize it then, but now knows that it was Joey Naki's unpredictability that he cherished. It's always a sad feeling every day, you know, once you start thinking about that he's not here, were the things that we're missing. But also, I try to remember all the good times that we had throughout the years. Ken has a lot of pride for what his brother and the Flight 93 passengers did. Ordinary citizens doing an extraordinary act. In just a half hour, they used their phones, realized their situation, and took a vote to act. After the vote, they got up their courage up and they um, acted on that information and prevented Flight 93 from reaching its intended target. And that's amazing. I'm just in awe of them. While some families have drifted away from the Flight 93 family group over the years, Joey Naki's little brother has remained dedicated to remembering. He served as a family representative on the federal commission that developed the memorial. I wanted to make sure that the 40 years of Flight 93 were honored 
cherished and remembered for generations to come. Ken Nackey sees the visitors who find their way to Stony Creek Township every day of the year, not a surprise, but the way it should be. It's hallowed ground. For me, after 20 years, it's kind of like going home. In nearby Shanksville, Ken says since Flight 93 came down, the people there have embraced the families, like the day not long after the crash when he walked into Ida's for a sandwich. Walked in there, went to go pay for it, and the guy says, your money's not good here. You know, just saying pretty much thank you, and, and I didn't know what to say or do. To this day, visitors can visualize the plane's final flight path. The wall of names acts like an arrow to the spot, but only family can go to the impact point, as it should be, Naki says, because the families consider it a gravesite. The actual unidentifiable remains are actually buried in front of the impact site. So it, for, for better lack of a word, it is. Even I sometimes, when I go back and I enter the actual impact site, sometimes I feel like I don't belong there. Ken's years working on the memorial and listening to the family's wishes created a bond, a bond that remains even as they change with time. This picture of all their faces and see how their kids have grown. Now they're married, some of their kids are married and have children. You know, I mean, we're grandparents now over, over the last 20 years. Over the anniversary weekend, they will see each other again, a reunion they never wished for. It's hard sharing Joey with the world you know, I mean, no matter who it is. It's hard for me to do, but I keep my brother's memory alive, and that's what's important to me. What a kind heart he had. He would give you the shirt off his back or the last dollar out of his pocket. He was a very caring soul. He stays close to his brother's sons and sees Joey in them. Ken Naki has become a fixture among the Flight 93 families and says he will continue to cherish his trips to Shanksville. It's easier to drive there than it is to drive away from there. John Shumway, KDKA News. In addition to the lives lost on Flight 93, there were also more than a dozen people who died on 9-11 who had ties to Western Pennsylvania. Here's David Highfield now with remembrances of the local lives lost. On a recent morning, as a light drizzle fell on Norwin High School, Joe Javor came to pay a visit to the man he called his best friend for decades, Brian Dale. Brian and I met, I think we got our first Holy Communions together. Uh, it can go back that far. This bench outside the school is dedicated to Brian, a 1976 graduate of Norwin, and to David Kovalson, a 1977 grad. Both were on American Airlines Flight 11, the first plane to hit the World Trade Center on 9-11. For Joe, 20 years after that day, Brian is still his best friend. Superhuman being, taken from the earth way too soon, for sure. Joe says at Norwin, Brian had both brains and brawn as the class valedictorian and a standout athlete. The two later served as best man at each other's weddings. And when Brian died, he left behind a wife and three young children who are now young adults. He would have been so proud of them, but up mostly, um, Luann, his wife, is a champion. Single mother to be able to raise three children and uh, make them the bright, beautiful children they are, that's, that's, quite, that's quite something. 42-year-old David Kovalson, the other Norwin grad on Flight 11, was an engineer for Raytheon. He was such a personable person. He had a lot of friends and he was so fun. Two years ago, when Norwin dedicated that bench in honor of David and Brian, David's sister-in-law, Lisa, told us she hoped the memorial would keep his memory alive for generations to come. Maybe, you know, his grandchildren will come here and they'll walk over to the memorial and see that on there and they'll, you know, they'll get a, a, a vision of what it was like to grow up here. Also on Flight 11 was the mother and sister of a man from Cranberry, but Scott Wallstrom says his mom, 78-year-old Mary Alice Wallstrom, was more than a mother. She was, uh, in many cases, my best friend. And someone who always lit up any room. She was the life of the party. As for his sister, 48-year-old Carolyn Mayer-Bugue. She was larger than life. 
Carolyn worked in Hollywood on music videos and movie soundtracks, working with the likes of Van Halen and Dwight Yoakam. Scott's wife, Kay, says Carolyn had beauty and brains. She was smart. She was everything. Carolyn and Mary Alice were flying back to California on the morning of 9-11 after getting Carolyn's 18-year-old twin daughters settled at college in Rhode Island. I imagine in my mind that uh, they were holding each other and, uh, um, and it, it does bring me comfort that, that they didn't have to face this terrible tragedy by themselves. 52-year-old Hopewell native Chuck Droz was on Flight 77 when it crashed into the Pentagon. In 2002, his classmates from Hopewell High School dedicated a plaque in his honor at the school. It's apparent that he was all of what he hoped and tried to be. My prayer is that Chuck's success in living life will inspire all of us to be better at all that we do. 31-year-old CMU graduate Larry Kim was killed in the World Trade Center, where he worked for insurance company Marsh McLennan. In the months after 9-11, we spoke with his parents in O'Hara Township, who started a scholarship in Larry's name at his alma mater. He was not just my son, he was my friend. I miss him so much. He was a really sweet person. And 49-year-old Bridgeville native Robert Collin was also killed in the World Trade Center, where he worked as an insurance executive. His family held a memorial service here in December of 2001. He was our hero. He was a 1970 graduate of Chartiers Valley High School, who married the girl next door. He's going to be remembered as the family man, my husband, father of the kids, and somebody that we just did everything together with. David Highfield, KDKA News. There were seven other victims with ties to this area, like Larry Kim and Robert Collin. Three of them were also in the World Trade Center. 43-year-old Robert Mace was a lawyer for Cantor Fitzgerald. His brother Kenneth lived in Upper St. Clair. 28-year-old Kevin Marlowe was a Pitt graduate. He worked as a bond trader. And 45-year-old Richard Woodwell was an investment banker. He grew up in Pittsburgh and Ligonier and attended Shadyside Academy and the Valley School of Ligonier. 39-year-old Patrick Dunn was killed in the Pentagon. He was a Navy captain and was married to the former Stephanie Ross of Upper St. Clair and Mount Lebanon. 46-year-old Ken Waldy grew up in Bethel Park and graduated with the Bethel Park High School class of 1973. He was on Flight 11. Another Bethel Park native was on Flight 77, 52-year-old Norma Jean Lang Sterl. She was a 1965 graduate of St. Basil's in Carrick. And 71-year-old John Yemnicki was also on Flight 77. He was a 1948 graduate of McKeesport High School and was a retired Navy captain. Two decades later, families of some 9-11 victims are still searching for answers. Still ahead, the lawsuit they filed trying to get to the bottom of who exactly was responsible for the terror attacks when 20 years later, remembering 9-11 continues. I was actually working on a ferry boat that goes between Orient Point in Long Island and New London in Connecticut. So I was actually on, on my way down to the ferry boat to start work when the first plane hit and then on the boat when the second plane hit and then of course we had TVs on board so we watched as the towers fell while we were in the, like on the ferry boat and then they brought in like the National Guard onto the ferry because everyone was sort of running out of Manhattan and coming through Orient Point and trying to escape the city because we just didn't know what was happening. Nobody knew what was happening. Last week, President Biden began the process of declassifying FBI documents involving the 9-11 attacks. This comes amid the persistence of families who filed a lawsuit alleging Saudi Arabia bear some responsibility. Andy Sheehan spoke with a local attorney representing two of those families. This development is significant. For several administrations, the U.S. Justice Department has kept much of the investigation classified. Now President Biden, citing the need for transparency, says some of these documents should be disclosed. 
20 years after planes hit the World Trade Centers and the Pentagon and the in-flight heroes bought Flight 93 down in Shanksville, families of those who died have gnawing questions about just who was behind the attacks. Why were 15 of the 19 hijackers, like Osama bin Laden himself, Saudi Arabian? Who supplied them the support, training, and flying lessons while on U.S. soil? And what role, if any, did some members of the Saudi government play? It's accountability and full transparency and understanding of why this happened. Who caused it to happen? In a lawsuit filed in the Southern District of New York, just blocks from the World Trade Center site, hundreds of victims' family members say Saudi Arabia made that claim. Though Pittsburgh attorney Tom Johnson, who represents two of those families, lacks direct evidence of the Saudi government's involvement in the suit, he and the other plaintiff's attorneys contend, quote, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia bears responsibility for the 9-11 attacks because its agents and players directly and knowingly assisted the hijackers and plotters who carried out the attacks. The case centers in part on two Saudi hijackers, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Midhar, who traveled from Saudi Arabia to California and later hijacked and crashed Flight 77 into the Pentagon, killing 125 people in the building and all 64 aboard. The suit claims a man it identifies as a suspected Saudi spy working with an imam at a San Diego mosque set up a, quote, U.S. support network at the direction of an unnamed Saudi official. This included an apartment and flying lessons, funding which the suit says came from so-called charities with links to the Saudis. Quote, charities that were not charities at all. They were vehicles through which the Saudi government could sponsor spying, terrorism, and who knows what else. But in court papers, the Saudi government denies involvement. Their lead attorney would not comment to KDK, but has argued in court the plaintiffs have produced no direct evidence linking the Saudi government to the hijackers. And in 2004, the 9-11 Commission report states, quote, we found no evidence that the Saudi government as an institution or senior Saudi officials individually funded the organization, meaning al-Qaeda. Still some say that doesn't clear the country. Johnson and his fellow's attorneys concede more definitive proof is needed and for years have pushed to declassify FBI documents concerning the investigation. They claim U.S. attorneys general over the years in administrations have kept them sealed. Not only can we not see the documents that our own FBI is withholding, what is being hidden, why is it being hidden, who is accountable for this? Johnson suspects U.S. ties to Saudi Arabia as a reason. Long considered our ally in the Middle East, the U.S. operates bases there, we buy their oil, and they buy our warplanes. If we are going to maintain the moral high ground as a country, that uh, we're not going to let money be a reason why we don't seek the truth and impose accountability on those who are responsible for killing us. The White House declassification doesn't mean all of these documents will be released. Federal agencies have the authority to keep them classified if there is a threat to national security. It will be months before the first of these documents are made public. Reporting on the North Shore, Andy Sheehan, KDKA News. The Saudi embassy to the U.S. has now released a statement saying the kingdom has long supported the declassification of documents in the 9-11 investigation, adding, quote, any allegation that Saudi Arabia is complicit in the September 11th attacks is categorically false. Up next, a return to Shanksville. How the lives of the people there have changed over the past two decades when 20 years later, remembering 9-11 continues. I took my children to school and on the way, the first bomb hit. By the time I got back home, which the school was five minutes away, the second one went in and I was able to see it live on TV. It was just a tragic, sad day, like unbelievable, you know, and all like, wow, the plane really went to the building.
told you earlier, for people who lost loved ones on Flight 93, the crash site in Somerset County has always been hallowed ground. As it's also been for everyone who lives near there. Russ Gadotti went back to Shanksville to see how that tiny town and its people have been changed over the past two decades. At 10.02 in the morning on September 11, 2001, this was just some old abandoned strip mine in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. One minute later, it will become the scene of Flight 93's crash. A lot of things have changed since then. It's no longer a strip mine, it's a national memorial. But as much as things have changed around here, for those living near the memorial and the crash site, much has remained the same. On the morning of September 11, 2001, as America watched the horrors unfolding in New York City and the nation's capital, here in rural Somerset County, Pennsylvania, everything seemed so far away until it wasn't. And you know, the building shook and there was a big sound. I thought it was a bomb. And I ran over to the neighbor and I said about, are you okay? Because I thought a coal truck ran off. The bang when it hit, that was all. And then the, the ground kind of shook. In a field just outside of Shanksville, United Airlines Flight 93, the last of the Al-Qaeda hijacked airliners, went down, leaving nothing but a massive smoking crater in the ground. Things in the small village were about to change in a big way, as the world descended on a place very few people outside of here had ever heard of. Lots of news people from all over the world, you may as well say, I guess. I don't know, but there was you know, here all the time. and The very infrastructure of this place changed almost immediately. Roads were being built to get to the crash site. More utility lines went up to better handle the communications between Shanksville and the outside world. But one thing didn't change here. Good old-fashioned American pride. Across America in the wake of 9-11, symbols of patriotism, of course, were everywhere. Here, too. But 9-11 didn't change that. That sense of American pride was already here in abundance, and it showed. And the world watched as Shanksville and its people instantly embraced the memory of the victims of Flight 93, their families, and this place's role in one of our country's most heartbreaking national tragedies. I think it was patriotism, and, and we just cared. As the years rolled on, American flags flew proudly here, unwavering. The red, white, and blue heart of this place continued to beat. And as the Flight 93 memorial began to take shape, the folks of Shanksville fought to keep that memorial right here on sacred ground where the souls on board that plane lost their lives. They said they were going to put the memorial up in Johnstown. They were going to put it in Somerset. And I said, that's wrong, you know. It has to be where it happened. Much has changed around and about Shanksville since that horrible day 20 years ago. In addition to the sprawling National Memorial that opened in 2015, there is a private Flight 93 chapel not far away, and other places throughout the town dedicated to Flight 93, or what some call the hero's flight. There is no doubt, however, for better or worse, Flight 93 put Shanksville on the map. When we'd go anywhere and want to get something, and they'd say, you know, want your address and say, Shanksville, we're Shanksville is what they'd say. Well, now, when you go, now everybody knows where Shanksville is. Still, if you ask anyone here and in the surrounding area, if the people themselves were changed by the horror that happened just over the hill, you might be surprised by their answer. I don't think it affected us. I don't think so. We're the same. I mean, nothing's changed, really. With the people? No, I don't believe they did. I moved on. I mean, you can never really forget, but you move on. So in a place like this, where time always tends to stand still, life goes on because it has to. But everyone here will always remember what happened on September 11, 2001. And no one here will ever forget the lives lost. In Shanksville, Somerset County, Ross Gadotti, KDKA News. Coming up, how a local woman is honoring first responders on 9-11. Plus, how the terrorist attacks totally changed security in the U.S. when 20 years later, remembering 9-11 continues. I was in my office in Gateway Towers, and uh, somebody from our office came out who was listening to the radio and said that this had, the planes had gone into the towers. And 
I just thought it was a joke. I thought he was joking around and he turned on the, the TV and sure enough, the television and sure enough, it showed that, you know, what happened. After the terrorist attacks 20 years ago, first responders from all over the country went to help out with the rescue and recovery missions in New York and in Washington, including many first responders from Western Pennsylvania. Now a local woman is making sure first responders are always taken care of on September 11th of each year. Megan Schiller explains how her one small act of kindness has turned into a large operation of gratitude. Okay, Aim, I've got the water boiling. I do. Squeezed into this kitchen in Swickley. Are there any dietary restrictions at the firehouse? Josie White calls the shots. Barb, if you want to throw those in here, because they're already cooked, they just need some butter and onions. She's gathered a group of volunteers who fight over first responders. We clamor to get our spots. One year I was moving and I almost missed getting any firehouse because they go really quickly. Firehouse 30, it's up in uh, Elliott. Um, so we've been delivering there for like eight, eight nine years. Uh, my, my wife and my three boys. I had people just beating down my phone and my door and my Facebook page <laughs> to be part of it. Everyone loves these first responders. On September 11th, 20 years ago, White lived through the day in New York City. We could actually see it from our atrium. We could see the smoke and, and the fire, and it was just devastating. But she'll never forget the morning after. I was driving to work, and it's 6 o'clock in the morning. And I look, and there's a parking lot full of cars. I was so distraught. I'm like, what are you people doing going into the city? You can't be there. And I kept driving and I pulled over when I realized, like, hit me like a brick, that these were all the mommy and daddy, daddies that didn't come home. I mean, it just, it broke my heart. It really, and that will stay with me forever. White later moved back home to Pittsburgh and struggled to find a way to say thank you. I thought, wait a minute, my brother's a fireman. What's wrong with me? And so I put together a lasagna the next September 11th and I took it up to the number 10 firehouse and I thanked them. And I told them my story and I told them why I was there and I thanked them and I said, here, have a, have a lasagna on me and thank you for taking care of me and my city. That one lasagna grew into an idea. It's now hundreds of volunteers strong in a private Facebook page. I went from serving four people. We served 1,200 people in 2019. Everyone got a meal and a thank you for running in when we're running out. It's not a high tech operation, but White uses the notebooks and the private Facebook group and acts like an auctioneer. That's a great analogy because I think it's so funny when I have like, oh, I want 28, um, 28's gone. Oh, okay, I'll take 31. Volunteer Chris Gargas, his wife and three boys answered the call. My kids just enjoy it every year because uh, every year there's different guys they are not the same guys every year because they always rotate. Volunteer Amy Galloway Barr says double the food, double the reward. So I live in Westview, so I do the one on the north side. I mean, there's several on the north side, but I do the one closest to me. And then I teach in Squirrel Hill at Alderdice, so I do breakfast for the um, Zone 4 police officers. The many requirements are simple. Just fill them up. She makes lasagna every year, a couple sheets of that, and a couple homemade pies, salads, garlic bread. So it'll be like, you know, shrimp, Alfredo or like a pot roast or something like that. And then I, we always do like a side salad um, and a dessert. For Pittsburgh firefighter Mark Brunner, the food brings much needed comfort to a hard day. Being in a firehouse on September 11th, um, you watch, a, it's a lot of documentaries all day long, from like the Discovery Channel, you know, just different things. Just You just rewatch it so you kind of relive it. What started in city fire halls recently stretched to the suburbs and also to EMS, paramedics, and police stations. It's a humbling reminder of why I got into this profession in the first place. Um, it's important to me, makes me proud to be a part of it. You meet a lot of your colleagues that you don't normally see on a daily basis, but this is a day that we kind of all bond together. Pittsburgh people are really good hearted people. And for White, it's a small way to give back in memory of the responders who gave everything. I don't think anyone will ever forget what happened to this young country of ours on that day. 
but this is a way of telling people, these first responders, thank you. Thank you for all that you do for me as a stranger. It's the least that I can do. White tells me she is always looking for volunteers and you don't even need to travel. If you know of a first responder in your neighborhood, you just have to bring them into the 9-11 dinner fold. All you have to do is find Josie's Facebook group and reach out. Megan Schiller, KDK News. From metal detectors in buildings to taking your shoes off at the security checkpoint at the airport, the safety of our everyday lives has changed so much due to 9-11. The terrorist attacks totally revamped security measures across the country. Once again, here's Andy Sheehan. In the weeks and months that followed 9-11, we used to talk about the new normal. Now security checkpoints like this have become ingrained in our everyday life. It was only one day in the history of our country, but after September 11, 2001, life would never be the same. Ever since, our once free-flowing society has been subjected to security checkpoints at all types of places. For travelers queuing up at the TSA security checkpoint at Pittsburgh International Airport, the new normal of 2001 has gotten old 20 years later. Oh, I can't stand it. I have, I have shirts that say old normal on it. I don't like, you know, all of this. I mean, it's just, it's so inconvenient. Those of us old enough can remember a time when we could go where we wanted, when we wanted. But today, you can't enter a government building without going past security, attend a ball game without going through a metal detector, or a church, synagogue, or mosque without passing a peace officer, all of which came to pass after the terrorist attacks that day. The enormity of it, it was an international shock to people. And we reacted with everything we could do that, that would never be repeated. And it um, changed our lives. It did. It did totally. Two decades on, the added layer of security at nearly every turn is here to stay. But the reasons for it have changed. Since 9-11, the country hasn't come under attack from the outside. The new threat has come from within. La Roche College University professor and former FBI agent Larry Lycar says the greater enemy is our own fragmented society and the domestic terrorists who spring from hate groups. And you start finding people that uh, basically join other people, like-minded people, you know, who basically have this idea that somehow there's, there's a hatred against certain other segments of the society. And you, you have, it's both race, religion, uh, ethnicity. You, know, you see those, those factors, uh, they've, they've exacerbated. While our security often focuses on people physically coming and going, Lycar says the place to prevent hate attacks and mass shootings is monitoring the dark web of the internet and infiltrating those groups. And while physical security measures like checkpoints have likely been successful in thwarting some attacks, determined attackers can and do find innovative ways to get past them. There's always gaps. Yeah, there always are. That's just the, you cannot eliminate risk. And it just, the question is how much you know, we want to spend uh, to do that, knowing that you probably, there's always a gap that will be exploited. 20 years after 9-11, some think it's time to take a very hard look at the best strategies to stop acts of terror, domestic or otherwise. What is needed and what may not be. I just feel like this is overkill. I really do. I, I feel like we should, you know, reevaluate our entire methodology of how we travel right now. Some may not like it, others may grouse, but after 9-11, our lives change forever. And it appears that security checkpoints like this are here to stay. At the City County Building, Andy Sheehan, KDK News. Still ahead, a call to arms. Two local veterans reflect on the war on terror when 20 years later, remembering 9-11 continues. I was in kindergarten, or actually pre-K, my mother came to pick me up and uh, there was about a two hour delay on the way to come get me. Uh, she's a preschool teacher and uh, it took about two hours to come get me and uh, two hours to come get back and she only worked 15 minutes away. That's how much traffic that was there during the time and just the commotion going on in the area. After the 9-11 attacks, many Americans stepped up and answered the call 
when America went to war. 20 years later, two local veterans say fighting the war on terror changed their lives forever. Here again is Ross Gadotti. On that crystal clear day in September of 2001, America went from a nation at peace to a country both dazed by a planned atrocity and ready for war. As soon as they told us what was going on, I mean, everybody at first instinct was like, when are we going to fight? In the months following 9-11, Washington County native Pat Burgess graduated Marine Corps boot camp. It became very, very real, very, very suddenly for everybody. Um, and it changed my entire outlook. Burgess is one of the thousands of Americans who enlisted or were already in the service when the United States was attacked. He was ready to fight, but he remembers not all of his fellow warriors were as enthusiastic. It was a mixed bag. You had guys that were, it seemed like, not that they regretted it, but they were starting to question, you know, what had happened. In addition to all active duty service members, Western Pennsylvania's local National Guard and Reserve units were also called up for service. Nearly all headed to one of two places, Iraq or Afghanistan. But Pat Burgess found himself in both destinations as America's post 9-11 wars raged. I deployed once in 2005 to Iraq. Um, and then I deployed again in 2010 to Afghanistan. We were in the fight, we were in the heat. It just got real. Uh, you know, I've said that and a lot of people have said that as well. I mean, it, it, it was game time. Now meet Robert Pra. After 9-11, he served in the Army stateside at first, then headed to a place the warfighters call the Sandbox. And in 2008, I was mobilized uh, in, in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. What happened seven years before in New York, Washington, and Shanksville were at first a lingering nightmare for him, but one he turned into purpose and focus. 9-11 changed everything, and during my deployment, all I thought about was 9-11. It's a common misconception that recruiters' offices were overrun with Americans wanting to sign up to fight after 9-11. There was a small increase in enlistments, but not that much. That said, both of these veterans say the vast majority of those who did join the service as sort of a call to arm were purely motivated by what happened on that fateful day. There were so many uh, soldiers that joined because to serve. I mean, our nation needed them. However, many of those people, including some of Pra's and Burgess's friends, would never come home. I have the, the, the graduation uh, book with all the names and faces. Uh, I look back and think of where have some of these folks ended up, and uh, it, just, it just changes our life. Major combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan are for the most part over now, and while their active duty days are behind them, the military service remains in these veterans' hearts. Burgess moved to the Army National Guard after his time in the Marines. He is now an ROTC instructor at California University of Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, Pra heads up the Office of Military Affairs at that school. But despite all they saw, did, and felt overseas in those years after 9-11, would they do it again? No problems. I would do it again. I would 100% do it over again. Because for military men and women, when your country needs you, it's just what you do. Ross Gadotti, KDKA News. As Russ mentioned, countless military men and women lost their lives fighting the war on terror in the years after 9-11, including many from this area. The first local casualty was Army Staff Sergeant Gene Vance of Morgantown. He died in a firefight in Afghanistan in May of 2002. A thousand people attended his memorial service a week later, where Vance's widow and daughter were presented with posthumous medals, including the Purple Heart and Bronze Star. For some, 9-11 is a bittersweet day. We're talking about people whose birthdays are September 11th, including a set of local quadruplets born on that day. Coming up here, how they and their parents are reflecting when 20 years later, remembering 9-11 continues. I was actually 11 years old and I was in school and they had actually cut class short and turned the news on and showed all of us what was going on. We all had a moment of silence for like an hour in my school. And, you know, we just all want to go ahead and pray for the people that, you know, try to do what they could to help save lives and bless those that were not in their right mind during that day themselves either, you know. So it was a very tough time for all of us. Six of the people who died on 9-11 were celebrating their birthdays that day. 
And there are countless others who also mark birthdays on September 11th each year. That includes a set of local quadruplets who were born on 9-11. Christine Sorensen recently met with them as they reflected on how even in our darkest days, there's always a sign of hope. Let's play two and two. With four kids in one family, a pickup game of basketball is a whole lot easier. Certainly one of the advantages of being a quadruplet. Eric, Alex, Drew, and Katie Wilbert from Peters Township were born on September 11th, 2001. Most people just can't believe it, like especially quadruplets on the exact day. People just are speechless. They don't know what to say. No one's going to forget our birthday. I, I get a ton of birthday wishes because people know. Their parents, Jan and Bill, remember how September 11th began with the joy of their quadruplets coming into the world healthy one minute after midnight at McGee Women's Hospital. But then... I heard him say, oh, there was a plane that went into the Trade Center and he turned the TV on and we watched the second plane hit the second tower. It was, you know, surreal. It was, we just couldn't believe what was happening. We were in shock. They went from joy to fear. It was tough. We were worried. We, you know, so we brought four kids into this world and we don't know what's happening. As the kids grew up, they gradually learned about what happened the day they were born. Every September 11th, their birthday parties were mixed with national remembrances. When they were five, they took a family trip to New York City and saw the hole that remained at Ground Zero and met firefighters who helped. They learned their birth date had a bigger significance. Think of other people and not just yourself, even on a day that's supposed to be about you. And I think that kind of taught us that from a young age. They'll never really understand what it was like to live through the terror attacks, but the pandemic is a national tragedy they are experiencing firsthand. They missed their hockey playoffs, high school graduation, and a normal freshman year of college. I don't think you're going to go through life without different phases of, of, of events that are going to happen and they're going to change your life. And, you know, obviously those two events are life-changing for, pe for people. I think I realized that you can't take situations for granted and uh, every time you get a chance to do something, you should do it. All of the lessons won't be revealed for years, but they can go back to their birth date for inspiration. But I think 9-11 is proof that as a country, as a world, we can always come together and get through anything that's going on. So I think that's kind of the connection for me that I could kind of see 9-11 as hope for what's going to happen with COVID. Many people tell the Wilberts that the birth of the quadruplets on the day of the terror attacks was the one thing that got them through that dark day and that September 11th will always bring a mix of sadness with joy, knowing that when so many people died, four new lives came into this world bringing new hope. I'm Christine Sorensen, KDKA News. Up next, the impact the 9-11 attacks had on us here at KDKA. As 20 years later, remembering 9-11 continues. I was a, I don't remember, probably a junior at Duquesne University, and uh, it was my 21st birthday. Um, and I remember the campus being completely dead and all eyes were to the sky that day. We were supposed to celebrate my birthday that night, but obviously that didn't happen, everything. Town, downtown was a complete ghost town. Everybody was trying to get out. 